Hey, this is Leach with Simpson Math, and in this video, we'll be talking about inverse functions. Now, first, what's a reminder of a function? Well, we've covered seven of them so far, and you might recall that there's something called the vertical line test, and if a uh, graph or a relation passes the vertical line test, then we deem that it's a function. And our seven parent functions we've learned so far are, well, function, meaning I could draw a vertical line anywhere you see the, uh, there are x values, you can draw a vertical line, and it's only going to pass through the graph once. So it's what we deem a function. The formal definition of a function is that a function is a relation between a set of inputs and a set of outputs, with the property that each input is related to exactly one output. That's hence the vertical line test. So when I say, hey, what about this x? Well, this x goes to that y, and that's it. So I can draw a line and it only vertical line, and it only goes to one. Now, if I draw a horizontal line, and that horizontal line only passes through the function once, then it passes what we call the horizontal line test, and then that means that that function is full special term called one to one. That means every x goes to only one y, and every y goes to only one x. So it is one to one. Um, and then it's what we and then it has an inverse function. So looking at the linear function, does it pass the uh, vertical line test? Yep. I can actually go ahead and just put a check on all of these. They all pass a vertical line test because well, they are all functions. But horizontal line test, if I draw a horizontal horizontal line, is there an example of a horizontal line I could draw on the linear where, where it only where it passes through more than once? Nope, uh, it's good to go. It passes the horizontal line test. So I, there are inverse functions of almost all lines. Um, if I did draw, well, a horizontal line, um, that horizontal line, though it, it is a function, it does not have an inverse that is a function. So there's one little caveat. All right, now what about the quadratic or the parabola? So I can draw a vertical line, good to go. But what about if I draw a horizontal line? Do you see that twice it passes? It touches uh, the it touches the, that function twice if you draw a horizontal line. That means if I ask, uh, hey x, uh, actually sorry, hey y, who are you dating? Uh, y will be like, ooh, which quadrant are we talking about? Um, so from the point of view, the, what's going on here with this horizontal test? From the point of view from the y, the relation isn't functioning. Now, when it comes to just regular functions, I don't care about the y's. We just care about the x's. Um, this is an example of like phone numbers. This and spoiler alert, this absolute value. Um, because if I was to plug in um, an x, so if I was to dial a certain number, uh, if these are the phone numbers and the y value is the uh, my source of the person uh, I want to get a hold of, well, I could dial a phone number and some people have multiple phone numbers, right? So this number could reach a person, but then this phone number could also reach that same person. And that's fine, that function, that system functions properly. But if I was to put in a person and say, what is your one phone number? Put in a person and out comes one phone number. That's not always the case. So nope, it does not pass the horizontal line test. All right, quickly the others. Uh, horizontal line test, yep, this square root does. We're good to go on that one. What about the cubic? and the cube root. Both of these pass the horizontal line test. I can draw all horizontal lines and they're fine. So check, check. I kind of gave it away a second ago. This, uh, the absolute value function, nope, it doesn't. Uh, it fails the, the horizontal line test. And then the, uh, what's this called? The rational function, it also, it too passes the horizontal line test. So it's good to go. So a inverse, um, is a function, an inverse function, is a function that when you, uh, let me back up, a function that passes the horizontal line test means it has an inverse. There we go. Now, how do we determine what that inverse is? Um, well, let me just show you. So algebraically, uh, let's say we have this function f of x, and it's f of x is equal to 4x. Let me switch colors real fast. I want blue. Um, so 
algebraically, what we're going to do is we're going to be ultimately switching x and y. So the idea behind inputs is that my input and my output switch. So you heard me when I was talking about these graphs a second ago, uh, that if I plug in an x, good to go on the quadratic. If I plug in a y, if I'm from the point of view of the y, that relationship is not functioning well from the point of view of the y. So the idea here is I want to switch x and y, um, basically, and then switch x and y and solve, switch x and y, what kind of graph, what kind of relation do I have then? If the inputs and the outputs switch places, inputs become outputs, outputs become inputs. That's the whole idea behind inverses. It's a pretty powerful thing, um, just in terms of practical life. Uh, if you know that if uh, I go through these steps, boom, 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 to achieve to this goal, well, if I'm given, if you have this goal, what are the steps that I can have, boom, 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 to come back to where I, to where I am now? So if I can do something forward, turn around, and do something backwards, that's that idea of inverse functions. Um, so back on this. So we have four steps. Our four steps are to replace f of x with y, interchange x and y, solve for y and then put it back into this inverse notation. So if I'm starting with this function, it is f of x, and I don't want to do algebra with, um, I, don't, I don't want to do algebra with the f of x, the function notation, so I'm just going to replace f of x with the y. That's it, just to swap it into a y, so that way it's a different form of the output. All right, now this next step is the, the step that produces the inverse. So I'm going to interchange x and y so everywhere you see an x, it's going to be a y, and everywhere you see an y, it's going to be an x. Now, just to note that I, I put a little, this is something in me, this is your teacher, this is not like a standard thing, but I put a little squiggly line uh, between these two steps. Why do I do that? Well, in math, when we solve equations, we know that this line should equal the next line, and then this line should equal the next line, equals the next line. There's this implied understanding. But does this line equal this line? Do they do an algebraic manipulation that keeps this equation equaling this equation? Actually, no. These two equations do not equal each other. So I know it's a little silly. It's not purely mathy, but I kind of I want you to do this to put a little squiggly line. It's just a line of demarcation, just to tell you to tell me. Okay, so now at this point, this is the inverse. It's just not in a convenient form, but this is the inverse. I did not do algebra. This problem has changed. It has now become the inverse. I've just swapped x and y. Um, sometimes you could also just kind of put this maybe in another column. Uh, if you have room on your page, you'd be like, this is the inverse, and do that work. But I just put this little squiggle. All right, so now that we do have this, let's solve for y. So I have uh, x equals 4y. My goal is to get this y by itself. So I can divide both sides by 4. So divide by 4, divide by 4. Now I have x over 4 equals y. Now, typically like the to say y equals, so I'm just going to do a little turnaround. y equals x over 4. That's not a required step, and sometimes when you're solving, the y's will be on that left side anyway. But I swipped, swapped it back that way. And then ultimately, I'm going to do this. I'm going to replace y now with something that's the uh, inverse function notation. So instead of f of x, it's f and a little to the negative 1 of x equals uh, x over 4. You also, by the way, just to note that this is, is the same thing as saying 1 fourth x. So I'm good with either of those, 1 fourth x or x fourths. Now, just a note about this notation. You were to read, you read this as uh, f inverse of x, right? This is not f to the first power times x. That's all the bad things together. It is f inverse of x. Uh, if we're in class physically face to face, I go, go around to every single one of my students and make them say this out loud. f inverse of x. If, in, if instead of function f, it was function g, this would be g inverse of x. Its full name would be the function f, oh, wait, actually, let me think about this. The inverse of the function f of x, if you were to like be all, all fancy to say other words, yeah. just say f inverse of x. Now, this is like to the negative one, that is a fake exponent. This is not a real exponent, not a real exponent. It is hanging out in the exponent spot, not a real exponent, right? You might have seen, if I was to refer to x to the negative one, 
that is x and negative 1 right there. That's the same thing as 1 over x. That is a reciprocal, right? That moves, uh, that moves negative exponents. You fix negative exponents by moving them to the, to the denominator or vice versa. This, yes, it looks like a negative exponent. It's the inverse notation. This is pretty standard. Uh, if you move on to pre-calculus, you'll see that the inverse trig functions, we put a little negative 1 uh, there, uh, kind of up in that same spot as well. So that's this is a standard for the inverse notation. All right, so let's write down the formal definition of inverses. So that's how we get the inverse. We swap x and y. Solve, um, solve for y, and then make sure we write it with the f inverse of x or whatever our variable is, or not variable, the, the name of the function. So let's talk about the formal definition of inverse. You're gonna be using this throughout the rest of, of today. Well, really kind of the course in your math career, but today specifically. So if I have two functions, uh, I could have named done this this uh, definition with f and g or whether, whatever two, but I'm going to go ahead and denote them with f and f inverse of x. So two functions, f and f inverse of x, are inverses of each other if and only if, I'll come back to that, um, these two things are true. So... Um, What's going to happen is we have an inverse when both of these statements are true. So if I have um, f of f inverse of x, so notice this is a composite function. So in my last video, we talked about composite functions. So I've taken the f function and stuck it inside, so the f inverse function, and stuck it inside the f function. Or vice versa, take the f function, stick it inside its inverse. What happens when you do that, you are literally left with just x. All right? Um, so... A little just math notation. I, I like just I like showing this just to expose some of you to some more mathy notation. So, if and only if is a very mathy term. It's so, such a mathy term. We mathematicians have uh, shorthanded it to IFF, if and only if. Easy example of if and only if, or or another symbol of it actually, uh, would be like an equal sign with a double-headed uh, arrows on it, meaning it goes both ways. It's true both ways. So, for example. Say I'm outside and I uh, see lightning uh, and then I hear thunder, right? If, I, if you see lightning, it means it's going to thunder, right? Versus if I heard thunder, does that mean whether I saw it or not that there was lightning? Yes. If there's lightning, then there's thunder. It works the other way around. If there's thunder, then there's lightning. It works both directions. It is a two-directional thing. So what this means is if I tell you, hey guys, I have two things, they are inverses of each other. Doth saith me, if this is a true statement, or just not just say you, just me, your professor, or the text, or something says, these two things are inverses of each other, then that means it, it will be true that f, uh, f, f inverse of x and f inverse of f of x will equal x. So both of these, if you composite them together, they will equal x. And then the other way is around, around is true. So if I have two functions and I stick them inside of each other and it equals x, then I can go whoop back this direction and say, yep, then those are inverses. So this is the definition of the inverse. You know they're inverses, then this has to be true. Um, and if we know that these are true, then we know they're inverses. So the typical way that we verify that two functions are inverses is to uh, plug them inside of each other, composite them together, and if, they're, if we get x's, then they're inverses. If we don't, then they're not. Um, all the ones in, in today's notes, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to find inverses, and then we're going to verify that they are. If I was to ask you, hey, here's two functions. Are they inverses? Plug them in together. And uh, you'll pretty quickly realize, oh, this is not, they're not becoming x. They, uh, it's going to like tie up into a big old knot. Uh, when they do work, then they, it feels like a slip knot. It's just sort of kind of just, happens and all just boop, 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 just undoes and you're left with x. One other just little technical note. This literally is an upside down capital A. Kid you not. Uh, this means for all. This is a little shorthand for all. So for all x's in the domain of the inverse. Uh, and then this is for all x's in the domain of the function. So the uh, there's a little bit of domain issue. I'm not going to get too much into it today. Um, uh, maybe in a, might make another video one day for it, but uh, so that is just a little technicality. All right, so let's go through. Let's apply this um, this definition to 
uh, the function f and its inverse. So just to be clear, so I'm going to take function f, which if you recall is this uh, f of x is 4x, and its inverse, I'm going to put them inside of each other, and you have to do both. So I'm going to take this function and put it inside of that one. So I'm going to replace the x with x over 4. And when I do, the 4s reduce, and we're left with just x. So just like that, uh, everything uh, reduces except for x. And I can do it the other way. Take the 4x and put it whoops, inside of that x. So I have 4x over 4. Oops, I didn't draw the thing. Let me do that. There we go. I forgot to make the 4s reduce. 4 is reduced to 1, and we have the x. So there we go. Uh, so since f inverse of x, f of f inverse of x, and f inverse of f of x, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, you'll get used to it, uh, both equal x, then by the definition of inverse, f of x and f inverse of x are inverses of each other. So that's what it means to algebraically find the inverse. Oh, sorry, that's what it means to verify that two functions are inverses. All right, so let's switch gears and let's do the same thing that we just did but for not something that's so uh, almost trivial with the with that linear function. So I have g of x this time. g of x is x cubed minus 1. I want you to pause the video, try this on your own. I want you to find the inverse, which I'll come, come back in a second and do. Uh, and then if you're ready to go, once you're, know that, once you're happy that you know the inverse, then verify that they're inverse. So pause the video and try that on your own. All right, so let's do this. So I'm going to um, first replace g of x to be y. So oops, a little bit thicker pin. Uh, so y is x cubed minus 1. So just a, um, changing g of x for y. Then this next step destroys it being uh, equal to it. It's not no longer g of x. It is now going to become its inverse. I'm swapping x with y. So wherever you see an x, it is now a y. If you see five x's, there are now five different y's in that spot. Um, and wherever you see the y, the y, usually just the one y, is now an x. Nothing else changes. I've seen students over the years when I've taught this, they want to try to drag this three over to that side. No, only the x and only the y change. Wherever you see an x, make it be a y. And then wherever you see the one y, it's now an x. Um, that would defeat the purpose. We're not just moving or literally just swapping inputs and outputs. Okay, so now let's solve for the y. So I have this uh, negative one and this three that have to move. When you're dealing with this, the general idea is, again, remember, uh, gamma, reorder of operations. Uh, when you go down gamma, uh, that is, remember, grouping, exponent, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. When you go down gamma, that's simplifying. When you go backwards up it, that's the order to solve. And so the addition subtraction are freer, things to move, then multiplication division, then exponents, and then start the, the process over once you go inside a grouping level. So is the 3 or the negative 1 freer to move? That negative 1 is freer. It is the addition or subtraction. So let's add the 1 to the other side, and I get x plus 1 equals y cubed. Then, uh, now that cube is ready to go. And we can undo a cube by cube rooting. So I cube root both sides. Uh, and when I do, um, I guess I can show that step. I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, right, the cube right here, cube root. So when I do the cube and the cube root, they literally reduce to 1. And so we're left with the cube root of x plus 1 equals y. Just for grins, I'm going to turn it around to be y equals. This step you really could just skip and just go and go straight to saying that this is the uh, g inverse of x is equal to the cube root of x plus 1. Make sure that your cube root symbol is long enough. I see you out there. Someone, one of you uh, made, did this. One of you went cube root of x plus 1. No, that's cube root of x. Pause. Outside of that is a plus one. That is taking the cube root and shifting it up one. This is taking the cube root and shifting it right one, left one, left one. There we go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's a big difference. Okay. So make sure that we're careful with that. All right. So now that we have our g of x and g inverse of x, 
let's verify that they, that they are inverses by using the definition. So to do that, I'm going to take the g of x and put it inside, sorry, the g inverse of x and put it inside the g of x and vice versa, g of x and put it inside its inverse. So we're going to do g of g inverse of x. So I'm going to start writing my g. I might even just sometimes just do that, just write the g in where I see an x, put a big old empty, empty space. And then I'm going to put in the g inverse of x. So this is the cube root of x plus 1. Well, as we talked about a second ago, the cube and the cube root literally reduced uh, to an exponent of 1, because this is a, uh, if you recall, if I have x to the 1, sorry, x cubed, and I raise it to the 1 third power, that's the same thing as a cube root, they reduce to 1, or vice versa, x to the 1 third, and I cube it, power raised to the power, 1 third times 3 is just 1, they literally just reduce to 1. So, we end up with an x plus 1 to the first, those parentheses aren't needed uh, anymore, so just minus 1. And x plus 1 minus 1 is just x. Notice everything just starts popping and undoing. If you've ever played with a rope where you leave the ends alone, especially if you had a rope that was tied to two surfaces and was a, and you had lots of loose slack, and you just start playing with it and kind of making knots in it and these little loopy dups, and it looks like a knot. But then you start pulling on the ends, as long as you don't pull it really tight inside, it's just going to start pop, 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 just pop and undo each other. So you hit a little, little, uh, little friction, pull through. It just completely goes away. They should, it should feel like slip knots, undoing slip knots as you were uh, doing this. All right. So now g inverse of g of x is three. Sorry, <laughs> three cube root of big cube root, big open parentheses plus one. So that's my g inverse. And now I'm going to type right in the g of x inside, x cubed minus 1, that goes inside. Well, those parentheses aren't really doing anything, anything for me, so I'll go ahead and just drop them, x cubed minus 1 plus 1. I know they're not doing anything for me because there's nothing multiplying, it's just adding, and I'm not just, you don't distribute addition. There's no multiplication, no exponents, so that's it. All right, uh, minus 1 plus 1 is 0, so now I have the cube root of x cubed plus 0, so I don't have to write that. As we talked about that uh, the cube root, the cube of a cube root is just an exponent of one. So we're left with just x. And so both of these check out. They both are x, so we verified they are inverses. This is a good tool to be able to check your work. Uh, if, they d if this does not come out, then you, either you're doing something wrong in these steps or your inverse is wrong. All right, so let's look at this one. Um, this is not note sorry this is not an example typical example this is just notes i'm wanting to make some connections over these next few little things so recall the definition of uh if f if f and f inverse are inverses then f of f inverse of x is x and f inverse of f of x oops i left that off is equal to thick equal to x so that's the definition. Instead of f's, it could be g's or whatever, two separate functions. Um, so just for grins, what if x was 3? So then we evaluated g of 3 and g of negative 3. So let's do that. Well, g of 3, I'm going to slide up just a little bit so I can see my g function right here. Um, so I'm going to plug it in a 3. So 3 cubed minus 1. 3 cubed, that's 27 minus 1, so that's uh, 26. So this means that g of 3 is 26. All right. Well, what's the inverse? G, g inverse of 3. So same number. G inverse of 3, what is that? Well, this would be the cube root of 3 plus 1. I could have put parentheses around it, but again, I knew that wasn't necessary from what we saw up here. And then cube root of 3 plus 1 is 4. Cube root of 4... No, the square root of 4, that's 2. I heard you maybe think that, but square root of 4 is 2. That is true, but this is the cube root, so that's all that, that's all that I get. So this means that g inverse of 3 is the cube root of, x plus, of, cube root of 4. I'm going to fix one thing. I'm going to rewrite this cube root, just a little pet peeve. It was a little short, if you look at that. Um, your, make sure your, cube, your cube, cube roots and square roots, your radicals, or go as far down as you tend them to. Um, and then when you draw your square root bar, 
that they um, then go as long as you intend them to. Don't make these little bitty, like, I've seen some of you do that. That's ugly. That's gross. All right. So now let's plug this value into the other function. So I'm going to take this and put this into the inverse and take this and put this into the original. So let's find what g inverse of g of 3 is. Okay. And then over here, I'm going to find what g of g inverse of 3 is. Some of you know where this is going. Let's find out. So I'm going to take the, that 26, this 26, and it's going to go into the inverse, which is this cube root, uh, the cube root plus. So this is the cube root of 26 plus 1. 26 plus 1 is 27. So the cube root of 27, the cube root of 27 is 3. So we get g inverse of g of 3 is equal to 3. Okay. Uh, and so let's see what happens when I do g of g inverse of 3. So I'm going to take this cubed root of 4 and put it into the g function. So that's going to be the cubed root, parentheses this time, ooh, gross radical, cubed root, there we go, of 4, cubed, and I forgot what it was, minus 1. Okay, well, what is the cubed root of 4 cubed? Well, the cubes uh, literally reduce to an exponent of 1. So now we have 4, okay, minus 1, and we're left with 3. So this means that g of g inverse of 3 is 3. So a few things about this. First, uh, recall the definition. This result should not be surprising. As soon as you saw this, you go, oh, well, it should be whatever this is. No, it's not a definition. This is true for all x's. I was just testing it for a specific x, and it should hold there in it better. Um, so uh, this is not a way to verify this. This step right here, this is a teaching step. This is just to help you understand what's happening. It's just a teaching tool. Uh, this does not verify that they're inverses because it's only checking it for this one value. Uh, if I plug in, the, if they weren't inverses, I might be able to find another, not might, I will be able to find another number where this wouldn't hold if it just does here. It could just be a coincidence. Um, so that's why we have to verify them for all x's. And so that's why we do that algebraically, which is what this is. So uh, one change, one big thing here is this. That notice that this shows the definition of the inverse, but only for that one x value. So g of g inverse of 3 should equal 3, just like if it's x, it'll equal x. Uh, if I plug in 7, this would be 7. If I plug in 1 uh, ninth, this would be 1 ninth, whatever. Okay? So if they're inverses, whatever this input is uh, will end up being that output uh, when it goes through the, that, co that composition process. It also shows this. So I want you to see something. So notice that um, when we did this, when I plugged in a 3, out came a 26, right? So my, in my g function, I can plug in a 3, and it'll pop out a 26. But notice what happens when I plug in a 26 into the inverse, because that's really what happens. I can think of this as just the, this, another way of expressing this, let me throw another color right here. This is g inverse of 26, right? This is also, or I'll even say also, not very mathy, just for notes. That's also just g inverse of 26. That's what this is right here. g inverse of 26. Plug in 26 into the g inverse function, what comes out? 3. Okay, so over here, <clears throat> if I plug in 3 into the inverse function, what, what do I get that comes out? Well, when I plug in 3 into the inverse function, I get a, a cube root of 4. So plug in a 3, out pops a cube root of 4. Cool. So when I plug the cube root of 4 into the g function, so another way of thinking this is g of the cube root of 4, right? That's that's literally g of the cube root of 4. So this is uh, cube root of 4, and I plug into the g function, out pops a 3. So I want you to notice something very, 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 very significant here. The x's and the y values have interchanged places. Now think about this. 
when we, the very first thing I did when I talked about inverses after giving you a little bit of introduction about the horizontal line test, is that if you have a function that produces an inverse and you just literally grab the y, grab the x and, and interchange, um, everywhere you see an x it becomes a y, or you see a y becomes an x, it should not be surprising that here in these tables, the x's and y's, they've also interchanged whenever we go from the function to its inverse. So let's explore this idea graphically a little bit more. So let's graph g of x and g inverse of x on the same Cartesian plane or coordinate grid. Then we'll graph g of g inverse of x as a light colored dashed line. So I've gone ahead and graphed g of x, which is the cubed function, the cube function shifted down one. So I went down one and then graphed my parent function dot from there, zero, zero, one, one, two, eight, negative one, 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 negative two, negative eight. Um, I also have my uh, three and uh, square root and cube root of four that I have over here as well, um, just to have those be part of the table. And then I added the other dots that I got here. So the actual dots here, so this is a zero, negative one, a one, zero, then a two, seven. But in between, if you've approximated cube root of, of uh, cubed root of four would be right about here, um, a little bit less than, less than that too. Uh, so that would be that point there. And then 326, so if I was to go over to three, it'd be way up at 26. I just don't have room for it on this grid. Um, all right, so there's that function. All right, so let's graph the inverse. So literally, the x's and y's have swapped places. And so that's what I have over here. I'm just showing you that the x's and the y swap places. So let's put those dots on the page. Let me switch colors. So I'm going to start with the, I like to start with the middle of the graph. So if I was graphing this function, I would just go down one. Um, that's my origin. So I'm going to take that point and literally just swap x and y. I know I have it over here on the table, but I'm just going to look over here on this graph. So swap x and y. So this point, is zero comma one. No funny business, nothing weird, just, sorry, zero comma negative one. No funny business, nothing weird, just interchange x and y. So x is now negative one and y is now zero. So let's plot that point right here. I'm gonna put a dot there. And this is gonna be a dot for my g of x. All right, I'm just gonna to continue to the right on my purple graph. So this dot right here is one, zero. If I interchange one zero with my x and y's interchange, I now have zero one. All right, so now I'm here at zero one. My next nice dot is two seven. There was a cube root of four three, but we're gonna let that go by. Uh, then two seven. So two comma seven, swap them, interchange them, and we're now at seven comma two. So we're gonna have to come over here to seven two, so just to be clear, seven two, I'm gonna put a dot right there. Okay, so now let me, uh, I was at where my origin moved, uh, and now I'm gonna go the other direction. So this is negative one, negative two, it's actual number, negative one, negative two, swap it, and now it's at negative two, negative one, so negative one, two, negative one, right here is gonna be where the dot is. And last dot, this is negative two, negative nine, swap it, negative nine, negative two. So I'm gonna be at negative nine, negative two. And so notice, it's the cube root function. It's this cube root function just to the left one, right? Which is, isn't that what our equation is? What a transformation of function says? So I'm just gonna swoop the cube root. Okay, so that's interesting. All right, there's a last task that said then graph g of g inverse of x as a light colored dashed line. Now what does g of g inverse of x equal? Let me switch to my yellow. Well, this equals x, does it not? 
and if you had to graph a uh, function equals x or just y equals x that's just that standard y equals x line this line with a slope of one uh with a y intercept to zero uh going through like that so i'm going to graph that a little bit nicer so uh, i like to just because i'm lazy i don't want to just think too hard um i'll just start at my origin and just head up uh kind of crossing each uh line on the like every other square diagonally, uh, and that helps me keep a straight uh, dashed line. I have enough trouble in my life keeping things straight. All right, so I want you to notice with that line, so there's lots of significance about that line. One, that's what happens if you compose them together. So if I put the functions together, that's what we end up. All right, also, uh, you might, I can't turn, if I turn my uh, iPad here, it's not changing on the screen. Uh, and I can't rotate this. I think it's telling itself. Sort of. Uh, let me cheat this system just a little bit. I can do this and then do this. Uh, yeah, let me rotate this just ever so slightly there. So, what do you notice? It's, it's a little bit easier if you see it that way. I'm gonna, I'll put it back. I have no fear. But what do you see about the relationship between the blue and the purple graph? The cyan, turquoise, and the purple graph. Well, the reflections over each other, right? The reflections over that dotted line. Let me rotate it this way. It might be, might be a little bit more visible that way. So if you look at it this way, you see how the reflections over that dotted line? Well, uh, whoa, it got angry. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it, oh no, what, why did you, are you actually here? Um, <laughs> uh, let me fix this real fast. Oh, good grief. That's what happens when I don't, like, apply it. Whew. Crisis averted. Huh, that was scary. Okay, um, so um, what's going on here? We're, so if you look at it this way, you see how it's, it is a reflection over that dotted line. Um, one, just think, just literally the y's became x, the x becomes y, so it's going to reflect over the line where y equals x. Okay, uh, And also what's very significant about it is that is the line uh, that you get when you compose them together. So they're going to be reflections over that line. They, uh, if... If the line touches, if one of the functions touches the uh, this dotted line, the y equals x line, they will then intersect at that line. They could intersect in some other location uh, potentially as well, um, but if they do cross that line, they they do form an intersection. Um, all right, so how about that? So this is an example of uh, that graph. All right, so let's move on. Mouse in a weird spot. All right, so let's find the inverse of the following functions and use the definition of inverse to verify that they're inverses. Mouthful. All right, so uh, I want you to try this one. Uh, this is very doable. Do it. Pause the video. Try this one on your own. All right, so let's walk through this one. All right, and I do have this note. So how would you graph this via transformations? So what is this letter? So let's say A, so it's our vertical stretch by factor of four. And what about this plus nine? Well, that's our D. So we're gonna have to take our rational parent function, which looks something like this, on your camera, probably like this. Uh, wait, yeah, like this, like this, and it goes up, it goes up uh, nine spots. All right, so what's the first step to finding an inverse? Well, if it's in function notation, gotta swap, gotta change it to the y. So now there's our y. And then um, what's step two? Interchange x and y. I like to put my little squiggly line. And oh, notice over to the side, I, I have pointed out the domain and range. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But notice our domain here, um, we've moved only up. So it's just x cannot be zero. But when we move it up nine, x can't be nine. All right, so now uh, I need to solve for that y. 
Now, which of these things is freer to move? This Y, I know it's not in a very convenient location, but this nine is not very friendly right now. I don't want to move that Y until that nine is gone. So I'm going to move that nine first by subtracting both sides by nine. And now I'm going to multiply both sides by Y. So multiply both sides by Y, and that's about as far as I can show you. Uh, this is, sorry, that's about as much as we can do with the multiplication by Y. Uh, I don't know what I just said. So when I multiply both sides by Y, uh, I, I'm saying I took to, I'm taking an extra step by not distributing. That's how you translate Mr. Leach. There we go. I took an extra step because um, I didn't want you to, I, don't, I wanted to show the distribution step. All right, make sure that we put parentheses here. I've seen students say times Y times y, and then they don't actually get this y onto this 9. All right, so make sure we have these parentheses. All right, so now I'm going to, um, oh, lies. I There's a reason I'm doing this in the middle of the night. Actually, there's not a good reason I'm doing this in the middle of the night. Um, I shouldn't be, but I am. Uh, so uh, on here, I have this uh, x minus 9. I noticed there was no need for me to distribute or we're to distribute and just make a mess. Uh, so now I'm going to divide both sides by x minus 9. So divide by x minus 9, divide by x minus 9, x minus 9 is reduced, and we end up with this. Notice it's okay here that I'm that I'm dividing by x minus 9 and that's reducing because I'm not making that x disappear. I'm just moving it to the other side of the equation. If this was set equal to 0 and I divided both, like if this were, instead of a 4 was a 0 and I, and I divided and I'm literally erasing the x, and that's more of a mathematical problem. All right, so um, one big thing that's happening here, uh, let's talk about these transformations. Um, so we, oh, we end up with h inverse of x is 4 over x minus 9. So we're called the transformations. It was going vertical stretch by 4, shift up 9. Well, now we have a, again a vertical stretch by 4, but this time we shift right 9. Let's focus on the up 9 and the right 9. Notice we're going up in the y direction, so in the positive y direction, 9 units. Now we're going in the positive, uh, that's left here. Nope. Uh, this is right. I need to point in that correct direction. Yeah. All right. Good. Like I'm normally teaching here in front of me. So uh, if I go to the right, I'm pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> so if we go to the right, there we go. Not like it matters. You're not looking at me. Um, that's so weird in my brain right now. Um, so we go to the right. And uh, what was I saying? So we go shift up nine. So that's nine units in the positive direction. And then we go shift right nine. That is nine units in the um positive direction for the x's. So notice it is in the same like positive versus negative. Up versus up goes to the right now. Um, so that's a pretty big deal. Notice, but just the, the thing here is that the x's become the y's and y's become the x's. So positive in the y's is now positive in the x's. All right. Um, now, what about this vertical stretch by factor 4? Now, the, remember the rational function is funny because a vertical stretch by factor 4 at the same time is also a horizontal stretch by factor 4. It's doing both. There's no um, there's no weird things here. Oftentimes with this 4, this uh, 4 usually will end up as a B, uh, as a 1 fourth uh, inside. But remember, mathematically, uh, if I was to put a 1 fourth parentheses x minus 9, these two things uh, equal each other. Um, and that, that is a B. I just didn't need to go about that with solving uh, when solving this way. All right, so then to verify, so let's verify this. So I'm, I'll go ahead and just show them both. So we plug them into each other, and notice they start to undo e uh, each other. So what I did here was I uh, ignored the 9 for a second, just let, let it be there, hang out there. We wrote this as divide by, right, division. Uh, so 4 divided by this, but then went ahead and turned it to its multiplication. So multiply by this reciprocal. So this reciprocates down. Uh, 4 is reduced. Uh, and I'm left with uh, uh, x minus 9 over 1, or just x minus 9. 
the nines cancel to zero, negative nine plus nine cancel to zero, and we're left with just x. Do the same thing over here, but this time the nines cancel right away, and then the four is reduced, and you're left with x. All right. Um, this next one is not as friendly. Uh, feel free to try this on your own. I'm going to go a little bit faster when we run through it because uh, it's a little bit weird and gross at, at times, especially when, he, when we get to the, uh, the verification part. But see if you can try it. A little bit of a challenge. So find the inverse of that and then uh, check to see if it's the uh, verify that their inverse is using the definition. Ready, set, go. Okay, that sounds like enough time. Okay, um, so first step is to um, rewrite k of x to be in a y, swap x and y, and now let's solve. So uh, here's what I was, my brain was thinking of a second ago. So we multiply both sides times the x plus 1, but I have two y's now, right? That's a problem. I need to get those y's together. I have this y and I have this y. That That's, that's a that's a problem, right? I need to get them. I need to eventually end up with y equals something. So I'm going to distribute and move things around so that way I end up with a with y's on one side, everything else on the other. So let's do that. Um, so I'm going to distribute. Then I'm going to subtract 2y from both sides and subtract x from both sides. So that way I have my y's on one side and my everything else on the other. So I move this over by changing signs, move this over by changing signs. I wrote my x first. Okay. So now that we have that, I still have two separate y's, but I know you know how. You know how to factor by GCF, don't you? What's the GCF of these two things? A y. So factor out a y. Now I have just a single y. It's like magic. So I have the single y, I can get rid of whatever is attached to it by multiplication through division. So I'm going to divide both sides by x minus 2, those reduced to 1, and now we have this over here on the right hand side. And so we end up with y is this, negative x minus 3 over x minus 2. You're good, you can stop there after changing it to k inverse k of x, k inverse of x, but one little note is that um, that negative up top, a little weird, you can factor out that negative one as a GCF and you can write it either way. You can write it as just a negative with parentheses or pull it all the way out of the fraction. All three of these things equal each other. So this one's a little bit prettier just for uh, writing purposes. Okay, let's verify. It's going to get a little gross, but you'll be fine. Uh, we actually did something very similar to this back in the composition uh, lecture. So go check that one out because uh, I'm going to move a little bit quickly here because it's already been about a 40 or so minute, 45 minute video. Um, okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and just dump this. All right, so let's go through this. So it's verify. So I'm doing k of k inverse of x. And I'm going to plug in the inverse into the k function. I can pick any of these three. Uh, I didn't want to mess with this negative up front. It could have been fine, but I went ahead and went back to this one and I plugged in and plugged it into my K function. Now I'm needing to get the uh, everything. Everything will eventually, if they're inverses, will just go pop, 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 and just slip knots. I'm going to be left with X. So it's going to be nice. So um, I'm adding these together. But I need, I'm adding the whole numerator together, but I need to get a common denominator so I can add them together. And when I do, I'll go ahead and distribute the 2. There's a 2 over 1 here. That's why the denominator doesn't change. Uh, and I distributed the 3, left the negative hanging out front for just a second. All right? And distribute 1 times that, and we end up with just that. All right, my next step is, I'm, is a little bit optional. I'm just going to clearly show that this is a negative times both of those. This is optional. I uh, just want to make sure it's clear that this is a negative times that. And then I distribute that negative and we have a, a negative 3x plus 6 up top. Nothing to distribute here. Uh, and here I did a few things at once. I was like, well, that's an x minus 2 over an x minus 2. Those x minus 2s reduce to 1. Um, you could do the keep do the keep change flip, multiply both sides by, you know, mul not multiply, multiply by x minus 2 over x minus 2, but 
honestly, I know that this that, that they reduce because it's the same over the same in the same position. So they reduce. Um, and then negative 6 plus 6, 0. Negative x plus x cancels to 0. And I'm left with negative 2x minus 3x is a negative 5x. And negative 3 minus 2 is a negative 5. Negative 5 is reduced to 1, and I'm left with just x. Done. Works the other way as well. I'm not going to go through that. Um, I did opt to plug in. Um, when I plugged into the inverse, I plugged into the one that has the negative pulled out, so I didn't have to worry about as many negatives. So that at the end, I end up with a negative times 5x over a negative 5 is reduced. Then I reduce the negatives. Negative 1 times negative 1 is a positive 1, and I still end up with x. All right, one last example. Um, so to consider this piecewise function. So I have this function p of x. So it's just this piece of this little line segment and then this ray taken off going through this point. Um, so what I would like you to do is to state the domain and range of p of x. Then on the same coordinate grid, so you draw this onto your notes, graph the inverse, so p inverse of x, and then graph p of p inverse of x as a dotted line, and then state the domain and range of p inverse of x. So pause the video, try this one on your own. All right, so let's take a look at it. Hopefully you got it figured out. Um, so let's consider this piecewise function. So first, what's the domain of this? Oh, I changed that to, to uh, orange for some reason. That's strange. Go back to black. There we go. Uh, so uh, the domain, uh, smash everything onto the x-axis. We go from zero whoosh, all the way to infinity. Then smash everything onto the y-axis, so smash onto the y, and have values from negative 3 all the way up to infinity, so that's the range, okay? And then on the same coordinate grid, uh, we're to graph the uh, p, p inverse of x and the uh, dotted line. So literally just take the dots and swap them. Some students have a, uh, they freak out about this step, literally just swap them. If it's a negative, the negative travels with it. Don't leave the negative behind. So if it's a positive negative, if it's a positive negative and you swap places, now it's a negative positive. It's the same, same thing, just the same number, uh, same number, same signs. They just, they all just swap. And also, they should reflect. If you were to draw, uh, draw them, draw the direction. This dot goes over. This perpendicularly, this dot goes over the dotted line perpendicularly, this dot goes over the dotted line perpendicularly, and it's that same distance. It cuts that in half. That's why that means for that to be that reflection. Okay. Um, so that's another tip to make sure that you're moving the dots correctly. All right. So then uh, dotted line, and again, is that dotted line y equals x? Um, and I'm writing it this way just so that we understand that is that equals x, that's y equals x. Um, and then lastly, the range, the domain and range. So domain is now from negative three to infinity. Wasn't that the range a second ago? And the and the range is now zero to infinity. Wasn't that domain a second ago? So in case you haven't noticed, we've, I've been sort of hinting at it and talking about it. Oh, I forgot to talk about it up here. Um, but the domain becomes a range and the range becomes the domain. And then we see it again here. Uh, the, the domain becomes a range and the range becomes the domain when you go from function to inverse. Uh, that's because everything, every single thing from just the x and y points, from the transformations horizontally and vertically, um, to the domain, to the range, everything about the function, um, the, its input and output switch and becomes the vice versa on the output. So this is all about the inverses. There's one little thing I didn't get into and that does have to do with domain. So if you do have a parabola, just go to this more empty grid. If I have a parabola um, and you were to be needing to deal with this, um, you and you were wanting to find its inverse, it's a little bit tricky, but you basically pick the half you want to deal with and inverse it. Uh, more typically, though, is if you have a square root function for some reason and you were to inverse it, okay, it would uh, it has this like ghosted other side of a uh, other side of the parabola. So in this case, you don't get to pick at all. You then uh, you have to figure out which side would reflect it over to 
and then restrict the domain of that inverse. Um, I'm not worrying too much about it uh, uh, right now. Just know that that is a thing, but I am not, I'm not getting into that here. So, well, I think that's it. So, okay, well, I'm done. Uh, hopefully that this video sort of helps uh, you understand inverses. And it was really big also, so I guess I'm not quite done. This culminates, this puts together lots of things. Hopefully you saw all of our parent function uses, all of our transformations in use, all of the domain popping up, the composite function popping up. This is this inverse uh, functions lesson, lesson is like a culmination of everything we've been studying over the past several videos. Um, so, yay, big day. So we're gonna put, put a whole bunch of things together. Hopefully you made some connections and then uh, you can show me some of these connections when given the opportunity. So take care. I'll see you in the next video.